now for our next speaker, I'd like to introduce somebody many of you might have heard of. Uh, his name is Gopi Kalil. <laughs> and he works in Mountain View at Google. Uh, and he's in charge of social for brands. Uh, Gopi, welcome to the stage. Gopi Kalil. Seven billion people live on our planet. Six billion have cell phones. This is the most pervasive technology in human history. And what that means is more people have this at our fingertips now than have access to clean drinking water or electricity. Can I have my slides up? So I had a moment of epiphany about this six months ago when I was standing in a small rice farming village in southern India called Chitlanjeri. Now Chitlanjeri has a very soft spot in my heart because this is my home village. This is where my grandparents lived as poor rice farmers and where my parents grew up without electricity or running water. When I was young, Chitlanjeri had three telephones for this entire village of 20,000 people with two digit numbers. And back then, I thought I was a child prodigy because I carried the entire phone book for a village of 20,000 people in my head. And I still do, 31, 32, 33. Six months ago, my parents and my siblings, we were all back in the village for a ceremony in the village temple. And as I was walking down these paddy fields, I couldn't help but notice that half the village had this amazing little organ that had sprouted at the end of the fingertips. And standing there, it struck me that any of these villages could pull out this little device, punch in 15 numbers, and be having a conversation with each of you. Six billion people on the planet now are just one phone call away from each other. Geography and location is not a barrier. Even language is not a barrier because these devices can translate for you as well. But it's not just that you can speak to each other. What is interesting to me is that this device allows these six billion people to capture a slice of your life as it happens in front of you through photo or through a video and be instantly be able to share that with your friends, your family, with others who may share the same interest, with your entire social network. That is unprecedented in human history. So what are we doing with that kind of power? Human beings have been intrinsically social before even technology was here. That is a fact. But now we have the capability to share things that are important to us in, at a scale and in a way that was not possible even three years ago. And I'll give you two examples of the kind of things that we are beginning to see. So let's take the London Olympics. All of you must have watched some event or the other and cheered for your favorite athletes. The Olympics just concluded, and they've been called the most social Olympics ever. Because for the first time, besides viewing it on conventional TV or reading about an event on a newspaper, all of us experience a slice of the Olympics through the eyes of someone else, some ordinary citizen, who was also experiencing the Olympics and shared it through social media. So I watched an interview with Rebecca Adlington, the British uh, swimmer and world record holder in the 800 meters. Now, I did not watch that interview on TV. I watched it on Cadbury's social media page because she's a brand ambassador for Cadbury. And when I learned about Usain Bolt's amazing feat, winning the 100 and 200 meters gold, two Olympics in a row, I did not watch it on TV. I did not hear about it on TV. I was at work. But it came through on my Google Plus stream when NBC Olympics posted it. And that's why we call it the most social Olympics ever. The second example, so one is in the time of peace and the other in the time of revolution, I want to talk about Arab Spring. So if you look at the events that happened in North Africa last year, there was a social upheaval that swept across North Africa, and it was powered by social media. You could call it that was the world's first literal social revolution. Because between three countries, Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya, there was 100 years of dictatorship. And then in 100 days, 100 days, the youth of the Arab world had overthrown three governments and restructured the political and social landscape of that region. 
How did they do it? They didn't have a military. They didn't have financial resources. They didn't have organizational resources. They used the power of social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, to get their message out and organize themselves. So that is the big shift that we are taking place. So this begs the question, if people watching Olympics, if people, the Arab youth are all using social media, how many people are using social media? How big is this movement? So for a minute, imagine that everybody who uses social media is living on a planet. Let's call it planet social. And this is how planet social would look. Of the 7 billion people in the world, 1.5 billion people live on what I call planet social. That is the population of China plus Indonesia combined. And on that planet, the largest region would be right here in Asia with 600 million users. So that is roughly the size of Indonesia, Japan, Vietnam, and the Philippines combined. And then the two fastest growing social media adoption countries would also be in the same region because India and Indonesia are currently at a 50% adoption rate. So all of that is great news. The numbers are just staggering and exploding. Before I move on, I just want to take a minute and explain you know, my position or our position as to what is Google doing in the social space? Because that's a question you might be sitting there and wondering. And the answer is very simple. When Larry Page, the founder of Google, took over as CEO last year, he laid out a vision for all of his Googlers to follow. And his vision was very simple. He spoke to us. In fact, he publicly posted about it on his Google Plus stream so you can read about it. He said, human beings are intrinsically social, and that is one of the primary needs of a users. I want social to be overlaid across all products at Google. Meaning there should be a social layer across search and YouTube and Gmail and every single product. What does that mean? What that means is when you use a Google product or service, you will get an experience that is uniquely customized to you based on your social network or your interest graph. What this means is when Esther Dyson is using any Google product, say YouTube or search, she will get a unique experience different from Thomas Crampton even though they're trying to do the same thing, say, book a vacation, because their social network is different from each other. Let me give you an example of how this might work in practice. So let's say I'm searching for hotels in Singapore. And you're familiar with it, right? Hotels in Singapore, I get a set of search results. You've all done this before. If you look at the second ad from the top, there is something interesting going on for me. Let me zoom in on that. This ad for Agoda says, May Tay plus one. It. And it's a photograph of May Tay. She's a friend of mine. She's in my social network. All of a sudden, that ad jumps out at me because a friend of mine likes this particular service. So I go from a place of what used to be ad blindness to ad brightness, meaning that particular ad is shining nice and bright in front of my eyes because someone in my social network is recommending that particular service. And what we found is that next to a search result or next to an ad, if we just mention that many other people like it, users are drawn to it. If we mention the name and the picture of someone you know, instantly, emotionally, we get connected with that particular search result. You don't see anything else on the page. And if that is the picture of someone you know intimately, like maybe your sister or mother, then that particular search result becomes, becomes hugely important for you. That is human behavior because we all trust the opinions and perspective of people we know closely. Let me give you one piece of data. Anytime we, we layer that social network, like the picture of a person, we find that people are likely to click on that ad or search result 5 to 10% more because you're, you're, you're trusting not just Google, but your social network as well. So with that as a preamble, I want to tell you five trends we are seeing across social networks, particularly in my role in Google+. There are a lot of interesting things that we are beginning to see, and I want to leave you with five trends. The first one is that social media is allowing for intimate face-to-face -face conversation between individuals, sometimes between brands. The most common way for human beings to communicate is very simply face-to-face, -face, even before technology. No matter what the culture, what the country is, people love to talk face-to-face. -face. So we thought about it hard and said, if we are building a platform, that capability must be in the product. 
So we built a feature called Google Plus, within Google Plus called Hangout, which allows the entire world to talk to each other face to face using video for free. It is a core part of the product. And all sorts of people have been using it because of the face to face connection, including one person you all will recognize, President Barack Obama. In January, he told the White House uh, digital media staff that he wants to get you know, even closer to the American citizens and want to engage with them using social media. So he delivered the State of the Union address, and right after that, he said he wanted to have a conversation with the citizens without an intermediary, no journalist, no spokesperson involved. So the White House invited people to submit questions, American citizens to submit questions, recording it on video. A quarter million people raised their hand and submitted a question. So it's not simply typing a question, you had to submit it on video, a quarter million questions. The White House then picked nine people, and these nine people had an intimate conversation from the comfort of the living room, just using social media, directly with the president, and everyone from the world could watch it. So you could watch it, you could add your questions, you can add your comments. It is one of the most interactive ways by which the president has interacted. So let's watch a few seconds of that particular video. Can we roll the video? The biggest trends is making sure that we're creating fuel efficient cars. Mr. President, if it's all right with you, may I just introduce you to my children who are yeah, sitting see them. just off camera? So come on over. Hey, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Let Nate in too. Here. Hey. Hi. How's it going? What do you say? Hey. Make sure to study hard in school and do what your mom tells you. We'd just like to thank you for giving up a little bit of your time to let us all be a part of this Google interview. This was great. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Jennifer, President. Jennifer, remember thank to send you. me that information. I sure will. See you guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So my question for you is, if President Obama is using social media to talk to citizens, all of you as leaders of your business, how could you use this medium for your brands or for the senior leaders in your organization to connect with the biggest fans of your brand. The second trend I want to talk about that we are seeing in social media is there are these beautiful human connections that are beginning to form that jumps borders, that jumps languages, and there is an important significance for brands here as well. So I'll tell you the story of how these communities are forming through someone called John Butterell. John is a photographer. He lives in Ontario, Canada. And as a photographer, he conducts something called photo walks. He gets together groups of amateur photographers, and they go for a walk around a park or a lake, and they take photographs and talk about shutter speed settings and aperture and lighting, etc. But to participate in a photo walk, you need three things, an interest in photography, you need to be able to walk, and you need to be there with John Buttrell in that park or location. So one day, John asked, what if I were to do a photo walk through social media, connect my camera to a phone, and broadcast it through social media, maybe using Google Plus Hangout, so that people in other parts of the world can sit in their living rooms and join me in a virtual photo walk? So he tried that. And it is that time that Corey Fisk joined his Hangout. Now, Corey Fisk has an interest in photography, but she has one problem as far as photo walk is concerned. The last time she walked was 10 years ago. She suffers from multiple sclerosis. So she joined the photo walk, and I'll let John narrate the rest of the story. Can we roll the second video? One day, one day, I was out taking pictures, and I thought, how cool would it be to attach a phone to your camera and hang out with five, 10 people? And they would see exactly what I was seeing through the viewfinder of my camera. <laughs> it was amazing. The next day, Corey Fisk came into the hangout. I love photography, and I have been living with the MS 10 years, and this is my world. There's nothing more to my world than that. I just said, tomorrow, I'll take you for a walk. I'm going to walk closer to that old tree over there. Down a little, okay. a little more, right there. Lovely. For a few brief minutes, she wasn't going to be in that bed she was going to experience her own momentary escape. See you later. She was on a virtual photo walk. The next day, we posted it. And photographers all over the world jumped on board. This is Utah Lake. Oh, yes, we have a key pearl. Look at this. Oh, oh my goodness. Can you guys see what I'm seeing at the moment? 
So after our first photo walk, Corey Fiss said, for the first time, I felt I was not trapped in my body on that bed. So as you can see, photographers from all over the world, from Hawaii, from Italy, from Africa, joined in, and were taking Corey on this amazing virtual journey using social media. Now, imagine you're a brand like Sony or Panasonic or Canon. Wouldn't you want to be part of this community? Don't you want to be in the very center of this particular dialogue? You need to be. So, and these communities are beginning to form based on interest group. The third trend I want to talk about is how social media helps you connect across your fans or your customers across all media. What I mean by that is don't think of social as a standalone, one touch point kind of strategy. The best brands are thinking of social media as an integral part of their overall strategy in connecting with the fans and customers. So I'm going to use AKB48 as an example. Are there a lot of fans here, AKB48? Let me hear a cheer. Great. <laughs> so this is a Japanese super fan, super pop star group, right? Recently, they had their annual election. It is so big, it's bigger than even the general election, the AKB48 general election. 28% of Japan tuned in to watch the general election, a third of the country. But for the first time, what AKB48, the, the, the organization did was they allowed their fans not just to passively watch, but actively participate in the election using social media from the desktop computers or from your cell phone. So all of those bars you see are the voting going on through social media as the fans communicate. But because they use social media, one more thing happened. For the first time, fans outside Japan were also able to participate in the general election. And as a result of this, this is such a hugely successful event that by the time the general election was done, through social media, the video was watched three million times. And on that one single day, AKB48 added a million more followers on a single day because of the tight integration of social media into their overall marketing strategy. So that is the third trend I want you to think about. Go broad and make social media an integral part of your overall digital marketing strategy. The fourth trend is deepening engagement with your customers. Okay? Because social media allows you to go a little more deeper into your customer's life and share their passions with you. And I'm going to use Toyota as an example. Toyota has 1.3 million followers on Google+. Think about the number for a minute. These are 1.3 million people who raised their hand and said, Toyota, we love your brand. We want to hear from you on a regular basis. And that's something we all dream about, for customers to come and tell us that. And the reason Toyota is so successful in accumulating 1.3 million followers is the kind of content they put out there and share with the followers. An example of this is this event that they did uh, a hangout with this gentleman there. He's a designer of their new concept car. So that is Koiji Makino, and he's the chief engineer of the FTB48 uh, concept car, which has designed a light car that runs 112 miles on a gallon of gas. So he did a Google Plus hangout where he asked Toyota fans to join in, and you can see them at the bottom, and they had a live conversation directly with the engineers, asking him questions about the technology and giving their feedback about the product itself. And because of this kind of content, every single day, Toyota is adding another 4,000 people to their followers, and they're finding it a great way to engage. In fact, the most recent post, I took a look, as soon as they posted it, about more than 300 billion 300 people reshared it. What that means is 300 people took what Toyota said and then pushed it out to their friends and family. They're amplifying Toyota's message. So if you're a marketing manager for Toyota or your brand, wouldn't you like to know who these people are who are talking about your brand, who are free ambassadors for your brand? That is the dream of marketers everywhere and was impossible till a few years ago to really have visibility into that information. But now, through social media, you have incredible visibility. And that is the fifth trend, to get insights into who are your biggest brand ambassadors. What are they saying? So let me use Toyota as an example for that. So Toyota posted about another concept car called the Kemetid. So this concept car they posted, 
If you see on the bottom right, you can't read it, there's a circle that says 241. It's not clear on the screen. That means 241 people took this message, took this picture, and pushed it out to their friends and family. Do we know who they are? Sure, social media gives you that scale. This picture is something called Google Plus Ripples, which we built into the product, allows you to see who are the people who then you know, ripple the message across the internet. And not only does that tell you, it tells you the name of the person. So in that, if you look at the top circle, that is Lucy Garcia. So you know Lucy Garcia is one of the biggest ambassadors for your brand because that circle around Lucy, that is big, which means she has 300, 400 friends. Every time she puts a message about Toyota, 300, 400 of her friends are picking it up. And if you see that Lucy is actually interacting with every one of your messages, you know that she's your super fan and you want to send her a gift basket. You want to have a direct personal relationship. So as a digital marketing person, this kind of visibility was not available even like six or eight months ago. It puts amazing amount of power into the hands of brands to know who your brand ambassadors are. I want to wrap this up then with my final message for you, which is very, very simple at the end of this. And this is a message I want you to think about through the course of this particular day as different speakers come up here. And the message is simple. Your children, if you have them, are on social. Your customers are on social. Your competitors are on social. The only question that is left then is, are you and your brand on social? And if you're not, you have two choices. Two choices. Either you continue to sit it out, in which case you completely miss out the dialogue, like what's happening I showed you in the photographic community, and you become irrelevant in the marketplace. Or you embrace this medium and integrate this into your overall digital marketing strategy and use social as one more touch point to reach out to your most rabid fans, to your biggest customers, and start a new dialogue that is not possible before. Now, I know all of you are savvy social media users and also early adopters and innovators. Otherwise, you would not be here, right? So you've taken the time to come and interact with others and learn about it. So I want to leave you with the final message that you know, treat this as one more adventure in your life, in your career, and I wish you a really adventurous fun ride as together, collectively, as an industry, we're trying to figure out this brave new medium that is completely changing uh, the human landscape on this particular planet. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Thank you very much, that, Kopi. Yeah, I've got, we've got a treat for you, which is we're going to bring you one of the you know, deepest thinkers, one of the biggest innovators we all know in the world of advertising and media. So live from Sydney, using Google, or using social media, using Google Plus I'm Hangouts, we bring to you Sir Martin Sorrell. And here's Thomas Crampton yes, with an introduction. Yes, uh, we have Sir Martin Sorrell. He's joining us from the Sydney Hangout. Uh, do we have a laptop here so we can see Sir Martin? Uh, who is my boss's boss, uh, so be nice. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, he's uh, uh, in Sydney going to be speaking with us. Uh, he's here, Thomas. Yeah. Well, we got the, the live yeah. here. Okay, great. Yeah. Let's go live to the camera here. Ah, good morning, Sydney. Yes, Thomas, I recognize Thomas. Hello, Thomas, how are you? Uh, I'm with Gopi Kalil from uh, Google, and we have just a few questions for you. We've got about 500 delegates here. Uh, from across the Asia Pacific region, uh, everybody's here interested I, in social I, be, media. I, I, be, I believe you, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there's a thousand five hundred. I, I can't. I can't see them. I've got no idea whether they're there. <laughs> Might be just the cleaning lady in there. <laughs> so we have a few questions for you. Gopi's just given a very good presentation about looking at social from the the broad perspective, how it's changing. Uh, humanity, the way people are living their lives, and Gopi, following on that, maybe you have a, a follow-up or so. Sure. So, it's going to be down. It's going to be downhill from that from now on. <laughs> so, Sir so Martin Sorrell, there's an important question I've pondered about. Actually, most of the audience has pondered about all night. I've been dying to ask you first thing this morning, and that question is, which of the characters in the TV series Mad Men is your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, smarty pants. I mean, I, I did, 
I did get I did get forewarning about this question. And and I, I went through the normal. I mean you you would obviously say Don Draper. The one the one I actually like best or or sort of best, as I'll explain in a second, is the owner of the agency, the ex owner of the agency, the one who has the the Japanese fetish. I can't remember his name. Um, and, and the one, the one who does, you know, walks around without his shoes. He's still alive. He looks like a sort of smaller version of Burl Ives. Uh, but, but the character I really love is the Red Setter. Uh, you may remember there was the Red Setter that the yeah. guy who deserted to McCann's had, yeah. uh, and it made a brief appearance in one of the. Uh, one of the uh, episodes, and that's the character I really love because I have a red setter called Savage, uh, because he isn't, uh, and and he's he's my favorite character. Fantastic. Well, thank okay, you. Well, thank I'm you, Gobi, for that enough. information. That I'm sure our audience yeah. at Social Media Matters is uh, was waiting on the edge of their seat to find <laughs> out. And so and Sir Martin Sorrell likes the guy who wears <laughs> slippers. Okay. Uh, Thomas said no more questions for Gopi because he wants to ask the intelligent questions. Go ahead, Thomas. <laughs> Um, just, you know, we've heard a lot about changing human relationships. W what have you seen in terms of social media changing the way that, that businesses are, are working uh, and maybe some of the, the many business leaders that you're meeting uh, in your travels around the world? Well, I, I think the initial reaction, Thomas, was uh, they were petrified because, because uh, business leaders have managed to be surrounded by, by their staff particularly of larger companies, they've managed to insulate themselves or think they've managed to insulate themselves from, from customers, from people inside their organizations. Um, but I, I think the initial reactions were one of fear and uh, obviously because it's new technology and most of them tend to be older and not geeks or technologically savvy, they, they in, Instinctively, the Pavlovian reaction was one of uh, concern uh, and fear, uh, and of course the immediacy of it all. Um, every, you know, it's, it's uh, to say it's it's a bit trite to say everything moves at light speed, but they were not used to dealing with things rapidly. I mean, inherently, bureaucracies do not like to move at light speed or quickly. Uh, lawyers, particularly when you get into legal issues, you know, you take crisis issues, the lawyers have control and CEOs are prohibited for legal reasons of res responding. So I think the initial reaction, if you went back a few years ago, was one of fear, unwillingness to embrace, uh, bureaucracies and advisors kept people away. I, I was thinking actually, uh, as we were sitting here, um, just preparing for the session, you know, what is the thing that made um, business leaders embrace social more rapidly than anything else? I mean, clearly, some of the crises that they saw, you know, if you were in China and you saw what happened in China to most, if not all, of our multinational clients, they've all had uh, crises to deal with, but, you know, you've seen that in other parts of the world, too. You look at the banking crises in America, you look at uh, what BP had to go through with the Gulf. All of these things have made people, I think, more responsive. But I think the biggest issue, and you and I, Thomas, have spent time on this, is the sort of thing we see at the political end. I think Obama's 2008 uh, political campaign probably had the biggest impact on on business leaders when they saw two things. Firstly, Obama use uh, digital in an extremely effective way uh, politically to mobilize uh, ethnic groups, to mobilize youth, uh, particularly in terms of campaign workers. And then the thing that we were heavily involved in, which was uh, his social campaign for contributions, where he, if you remember, he had that, well, you know, he had that very broad spread of contributions, small amounts per head, and you see, we, you know, we're doing it again uh, this year for uh, the second campaign, and it's very different with Romney. Romney has, I think, it's an average of fourteen hundred dollars per head, whereas Obama is at about forty-three dollars per head. 
So it's, uh, it's much broader with Obama than it was last time because he's lost support with some uh, categories. But we'll, he will still raise a billion dollars from private contribution. Uh, so I think actually the use in the political area uh, has actually been the most impactful. And when what's interesting about business leaders is when they see political leaders building campaigns uh, in that way, they get influenced more. And after all, uh, crisis campaigns, as you well know, Gopi knows too, uh, political campaigns uh, mirror what you see in commercial campaigns. And some of the crisis situations, any brand things, are all about similar, have similar elements. <laughs> So, sort of wrapping up the, 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 the hangout, unfortunately, we're such a packed day here. Um, next year, we're planning to have you here, of course, in person. Uh, the uh, piece of advice that you would give to a business leader about social, what is, what is the one piece of advice you'd give them? Well, I, I think don't be frightened of it, embrace it. I mean, I, I think social has become, and this may be something you totally disagree with, but I think it has become too open, uh, too lacking in privacy, uh, and too exposed. In other words, uh, I think the future, and what do I know, but i just give you as this, I, I think the future of closed networks, for want of a better phrase, I mean, I don't think I've described it adequately, rather than open networks, is more assured. I mean, I, uh, if I look at Facebook, and you know, I, I, I get myself into trouble by saying this, I think Facebook is the the most potent branded uh, branding mechanism, but it's not an advertising mechanism. And you know our relationship with Google, which has become so important, and now rivals our biggest relationship with any legacy media owner, has five legs to it. It has search, display, video, social, and last but not least, mobile. And we haven't made enough. Uh, penetration of mobile. I hope Google's acquisition of Motorola Mobility will focus people's attention on the potential of mobile. But um, I, I just think the advice would be embrace. Uh, I worry about the privacy issue, not for the reason I just said, but just because consumers are and regulators are increasingly concerned about it. But I do think it has become too open. Uh, you know, there are privacy issues, there are all sorts of issues that parents worry about, for example, in relation to what their kids are doing or not doing, uh, so there's that as well. But I just think the time is right for selective networks or closed networks. So LinkedIn, I look at the success of LinkedIn uh, and I look at some of the other failures that we've seen knocking around and I think to myself that actually there may be more to that than even more than even I realize, and uh, I I would certainly welcome it. Welcome it. You know, more targeted, more directed. Uh, Facebook is now what the third largest country on the planet. I'm sure it'll become the largest country on the planet. But I think there are some uh, premia that one can develop for uh, more private and more uh, uh, closed networks, as I said. Excellent. Thank you very much. And we will now Thanks let you, much, uh, Thanks, we'll let you shuffle, shuffle down to the beach there in Sydney uh, and, and enjoy the I, surfing I, I, this I, afternoon. You, you don't know, I, I am wearing my bathing trunks beneath, <laughs> beneath the street. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for joining us. The future is embrace it you, and, and look to the closed you, networks. I should spare you the sight of my bathing trunks. <laughs> okay. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>